Would you love me? Would you love me? Could you love me? Do you love me? Could you love me for all I am? Because you are, because I'm not. Would you love me? Could you love me? Would you love me? For all I am Because you Feel you here. You are, you are. I feel you love me for all I am. I know you love me. Jesus, you love me for all I am. And I'm broken. But you love me, you love me for all I am, and you make me, make me whole again. We're in the fourth week of our current series, All About Grace. All of us can agree. The season of Christmas is a very special season, but it's really a season of grace. In fact, I'm making the argument in this series that in this time before Christmas, there are particular graces available to us now, not available at other times of the year. Grace is a gift. It's a gift we receive from God. We experience grace when God acts in our lives and accomplishes what we could never accomplish all alone and on our own or only through our own powers and abilities. So three weeks ago, we looked at the importance of recognizing, using a common image from Scripture, that we are like sheep. We're like sheep who need a shepherd. We need God to guide us and lead us, and when we allow Him to do that, God's grace can meet us wherever we are, to provide whatever we need. We also mentioned that ultimately we receive grace in order to extend grace. Two weeks ago, we looked at the gift of peace. We said God's grace and peace go together. God's peace comes from knowing that we're in right relationship with Him because of His initiative, not ours. We hold on to God's peace precisely by trusting Him. Last week, we looked at the grace of comfort. Comfort, we said, is achievable because God uses all things for our good. Even our struggles and trials have a purpose that God is working out in our lives. We'll wrap up our series on Christmas Eve, but meanwhile, if you've missed any or all of our messages, you can catch up online. Our online archive is also a great place to share a message. Did you know that the third Sunday of Advent is traditionally called Gaudete Sunday? Gaudete, to rejoice, rejoice. It's the Sunday of joy, and the principal joy being the joy that Christmas is so close. In some churches, this Sunday is marked by a pink candle in the Advent wreath, the color, I suppose, suggesting a lighter 
brighter theme. Some of my supremely confident colleagues even wear pink vestments on this Sunday. I don't do pink. Anyway, this week we're looking at our desire for joy in this Christmas season and how we can position ourselves to receive it. At Christmas time, above any other time, we all want to experience the joy of the season. That's what we want for ourselves and our families. That's what we wish for our neighbors and friends. That's our prayer for the world. We long for joy, and yet it so often feels out of our grasp. We'll see why that is so in a moment, because today we're going to look at our relationship to joy. To help us out, we're once again going to look at a passage from the prophet Isaiah. As we mentioned last week, Isaiah lived 700 years before the birth of Jesus. We read from his book several times during the Advent season every year because he wrote so many prophecies about the coming of Christ. Isaiah wrote about how Christ would be recognized when at last he came, what he would say and do, as well as what he would accomplish. In short, he wrote about the mission and message of the Messiah, and so it was the very first time in the Gospels that Jesus spoke publicly, he chose to quote Isaiah to sum up his message and mission and confirm that he was indeed the long-awaited promised Messiah. Isaiah wrote, and Jesus said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring glad tidings to the poor. To be anointed is to be given a divine mission. Christ is sent by God the Father to undertake a divine mission of bringing glad tidings to the poor. By poor, of course, he certainly means those lacking in material resources. However, he's also referring to anyone who is emotionally or spiritually impoverished, anyone who feels a lack in their lives, as if something is missing. The promises continue. Isaiah wrote, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives, to announce a year of favor. Taken together, the scope of these pro promises is really breathtaking. Jesus comes to heal the brokenhearted. And guess what? Every, everyone is at least a little brokenhearted. He comes to heal those places of your heart that are shattered, disappointments that continue to disappoint, sadness and sorrow that never quite lets up, wounds that just won't heal. Jesus comes to proclaim liberty to captives. And again, in one way or another, we're all captives. He comes to free us from the prisons of our own making, the negative thinking that holds us back, the worry and doubt that confounds and confuses us, the needless guilt and self-condemnation we impose on ourselves. He comes to free us from the chains of addiction or unforgiveness. And Jesus comes to announce a year of favor. Favor means that God is with us and for us and wishes us only blessings and good things. A year of favor refers to a whole season of blessing, blessing upon blessing upon blessing. Isaiah continues and concludes, to place on those who mourn a crown instead of ashes, oil of gladness instead of mourning, a glorious mantle instead of a faint spirit. Each of these verses describes a reversal, God taking a negative and making it a positive, specifically taking our negative experiences and making them positive experiences. It's incredible. We give Him our faults and failures, and He can turn them into success. We give Him our sadness and sorrow, and he can replace it with gladness. We give him weakness and worry. In exchange, he can grant us courage and even character. 
As I mentioned, the scope of these promises is breathtaking, incredible, really, prompting the question, if all I just said is true and can be trusted to be true, what would that mean for you? If I said God promises that through a relationship with His Son, He can heal your hurts and free you from whatever is holding you down and tripping you up, if you really believe God wants you to know His favor this Christmas, what would that mean for you? Would it not, should it not, mean for all of us what it meant for Isaiah? Isaiah said, I rejoice heartily in the Lord. God is the joy of my soul. Isaiah believed that the promises of the Lord would be fulfilled, and the consequence of that belief, the fruit of that belief, was joy. Joy, as we learn over and over and over again in Scripture, is a divine attribute. That's why it seems so elusive. Pleasure we can manufacture and control. Laughter can have many sources. Happiness is sometimes easily achieved, sometimes even stumbled into accidentally. Joy is different. Joy is a divine attribute. It can't be manufactured or made up. It can only be received. As Isaiah wrote, God is the joy of our soul. You may not like your current circumstances. You might not be happy with how things are going or where you're at right now, but you can still have joy in your soul. How? Well, it's really not that complicated. If you want to get warm on a cold day, you need to stand by the fire. If you want to experience joy, you need to draw near to the Lord. Joy comes from allowing the fire of His grace to direct and determine our lives. It's why we enter into His presence here at Mass and receive Him in Holy Communion. It's why we get alone with God in our quiet time where we read God's Word and listen for His voice. It's why we serve and give and care for each other and seek to grow as disciples, to draw near to the source of joy. You know, the principal reason for joy is that God sends His Son to us this Christmas to fulfill all the promises of Isaiah. We rejoice because God's will is to fill us and free us and heal us and turn our negative experiences around. But there's another reason for joy, too. God intends to use us to share this good news with others. Jesus is the Christ. He is the anointed with a divine mission. But if you've been baptized, you're anointed, too. You're anointed and set apart for a divine mission, a mission like His, to heal, to fill, to free, and to help others turn their ne negative experiences around. You've been anointed to bring the good news of God's grace to others. So if we really want to position ourselves to receive more of God's joy, may I suggest two action steps these last days before Christmas. First step, take some time in your quiet time this week to pray, of course, but to pray specifically for everyone who will be coming to Christmas Eve Mass at the Cow Palace next week. How wonderful would it be if our whole parish was praying for them? Pray especially that whatever burdens they're carrying or sorrow they bear, that the evening can be an experience of joy for them, an experience of joy that will awaken in them a desire to draw nearer to the source of joy. Second step, make an invitation to the fairgrounds. As Tom mentioned, as you leave Mass today, grab one of our fairground guides, which include invitation cards that you can share with friends or family that don't have a church. As we prepare for Christmas Eve Mass at the fairgrounds, starting today, we're working to create an exceptional, an irresistible environment where people, people who don't have a church, people who don't even like church, or perhaps people who are far from God can really experience 
the joy of the Lord. I don't like to overpromise, and I always try not to, but no kidding. I've heard the rehearsals. I've seen the plans. It's going to be an extraordinary evening. It's going to be an extraordinary experience, all of which is to say, if you are successful in getting a guest to join you at the Cow Palace, we won't let you down. If you think about it, both steps, the prayer for others and the invitation, take the focus off ourselves and put it squarely on God and others. And that's the thing about joy, isn't it? It's not about us. In our moments of greatest joy, we're not thinking about ourselves at all. We're thinking about something or someone else outside of ourselves, whether it's the beauty of creation, the laughter of your kids and grandkids, the goodness of God. Take some time this week to focus on God and others and in just that way draw near to the source of joy. You know, we can't demand grace. We don't deserve it. We'll never, ever earn it. But we can position ourselves to recognize it and receive it. And that's really what Advent is all about, positioning ourselves to recognize and receive the grace and favor of God given at Christmas. Thanks so much for watching. Hit that subscribe button so you don't miss a single video. You can be a part of our mission to love God, love others, and make disciples simply by sharing this video. We are so grateful you are a part of this community.